Great to see everyone here this morning. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Hosea. If you don't know where that's at, it's in the Old Testament right next to Daniel. If you'll go to the table of content, in the front of your Bible, you can get the exact page number. Let's see what mine is here. Huh, mine doesn't have a page number. I believe it's 800 and something. Anyway, I'm, I'm there anyway, so, so you're good to go. Let me just say before we get started this morning, for those of you who participated in the Fall Festival this year, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. There were some of you who worked behind the scenes. You did prep work before it ever took place. Um, there were so much... So much work that, that went into this by so many of you, and I wish I could call you all by name this morning, but I know I'd miss somebody. And so thank you so much. I just praise God for the day that we had yesterday. Right now we're in a series entitled Great Stories of the Bible. So far in this series, we've looked at Elijah, Gideon, Naomi, Queen Esther. And then last week we talked about King Hezekiah. If you missed any of these lessons, you can get it on CD. You can go to our webpage and, and you can watch it off of YouTube. And so I want to encourage you to do that if, if that's the case for you. But before we get started with our next story, which is Hosea and Gomer, there are some things that I think you need to know. First of all, number one, Hosea was a prophet. And some of you are probably asking, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that God spoke through Hosea, and, and typically who God would have the prophet speak to were the people of God, the children of Israel. Now, there were other cases where God would use prophets to, to speak to other nations, but on this occasion, God is speaking through Hosea, he is giving him a message to pass on to his people. Now if you look at verse 1 of chapter 1, you'll see the time period of which Hosea prophesied. Okay, It tells us that he spoke by God during the reign of King Jeroboam, King Uzzah, King Jotham, and then look at these last two. These will be familiar for those of you who were here last week. King Ahaz and King Hezekiah. Okay, so you guys now are going to see how a lot of the Bible, it, it all works together and it connects together. Now, for those of you who weren't here last week, I will tell you, and you need to understand before we get started this morning, that this was a very dark period in the history of Israel. There was a lot of evil going on, even from God's own people. There was robbery, there was oppression, there was adultery, there was murder. But one of the biggest things that the children of Israel were engaged in was idolatry. Okay, and, and so the people, they are sinning against God. But here's the awesome thing about God. Throughout the history of Israel, God would always sin people send men, these, these prophets, to warn of the sins that they were engaged in. And on this occasion, it was Hosea. Now, Hosea was different from a lot of the other prophets in that God did more than just give him a message to share with the people of Israel. He actually made Hosea a living illustration. Okay? And, and I want to show this to you. Look at verse 2. And I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation this morning. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, He said to him, Go and marry a prostitute. So some of her children will be born to you from other men. This will illustrate the way my people have been untrue to me, openly committing adultery against the Lord by worshiping other gods. 
Okay, so there are two things that I really want you to grasp here. As we pull this back, God tells Hosea, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out and I want you to marry this woman by the name of Gomer. And by the way, she's a prostitute. And by the way, she's going to be unfaithful to you. I mean, can you wrap your mind around that? And, and Hosea, as, as you read the text, he is obedient to God. He does exactly what God tells him to do. Now, as we pull back the cover of this story, which is a, it's a love story, okay? What we're going to see is this. First of all, the irrational, unconditional love between a man and a woman. Jesse Jackson did a beautiful job at the Lord's table this morning talking about that. But also what you're going to see, what this love story between Hosea and his wife represents is this. The irrational, unconditional love God has for the children of Israel, but not only for the children of Israel, but for you and me. And we're, we're going to talk about this. This is, this is a very... I mean, it's, it's an emotional story for me because it is so beautiful. Let me tell you something, folks. This isn't that superficial, sugary Valentine stuff that you see on TV. The love we're talking about today is, is not this Hollywood love. What we're going to be talking about today is true love. And I hope you see that through this message today. What I want you to do is I want you to put yourself, though, in Hosea's sandals, if you will. He marries this prostitute, just as God says. Her name is Gomer. And if you'll look down at verse 4, Gomer begins to have children. And then, I don't know what time period passes, but as you get down into verse 6, she has another child. And then again, there's a time period, and we're not exactly sure how, you know, what the length of that time period is, but then she has a third child. And as you begin the book of Hosea, you begin to, to, to think to yourself, oh man, look at what God has done here. He's brought this prostitute out of prostitution, and she's married to this man of God, Hosea, and it's changing her life, and they're having kids, and she's a great mother. But really, that's not the story at all. In fact, as, as you continue to read, look at chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 5. As you look at verses 4 and 5, what you will see is that the children she is now bearing is out of unfaithfulness. The children that you read about there in those three verses, four, six, and, and nine, these were conceived, these kids were conceived through adultery. Okay? But to make matters worse, as you get into verse five, what you see is now Gomer gets to the point to where she walks out. I, I like the way, I, I believe it was Roy in his prayer mentioned it this morning, she abandoned him. Now again, this is a double drama, okay? This is a dr double drama in, in that this is also giving reference to the children of Israel. There were times when the people of Israel, especially during this time period, they were walking out on God. They had turned their back on God. And let me ask you this morning, how many of us are guilty of the same thing? How many of us have been unfaithful to God? How many of us have walked out and, and abandoned God? And that's what we see Gomer doing. She says, and, and this just kind of this just kind of gives us her mindset, okay? And I'm going to read it through the New Living Translation again. She said, I will run after other lovers and sell myself to them for food and drink, for clothing of wool and linen, and for olive oil. Isn't that terrible? She walks out on her husband from what she can gain 
from these other men. In, in other words, her life is, is wrapped around selfishness. It's all about her and gaining what she can from all these other lovers. I'll have better clothing and I'll have nicer food. And maybe some expensive jewelry. Maybe some expensive perfume. But for whatever the case, she walks out. And this is what I want you to see through this story this morning. Whenever we walk away from God, what ends up happening is we end up running right into God. That's the kind of God that we serve. Even though we walk away from Him, we serve a God that pursues us. Because He is so crazy about us. Because He loves us so much. I don't know if I've ever told you guys this story or not, but I'll never forget when I was around 10 or 11 years old, I was staying at my best friend at the Times house, John Bradley McDaniel, and his aunt, um, I believe, was a dispatcher for the sheriff's department, and she was actually dating the sheriff at the, at the time. And they come in one Friday night. I'm spending the night with John Bradley, and she says, how would you guys like to go on patrol with us? Now, for a 10 or 11-year-old kid, that is awesome, right? We're going to get to catch some bad guys. So we pile into the front seat of the sheriff's car, and we take off. It's a Friday night. We knew things were going to get exciting. And sure enough, we get behind this car that's swerving all over the road. And the sheriff, he hits the blue lights. And the car takes off, and man, he is pursuing. It's this high-speed chase, man. I'm just grabbing the seat, you know. And, and the guy takes a left, and the sheriff takes a left. And the guy takes a right, and the sheriff takes a right. And finally, the guy gets to the point where he realizes, I can't get away, and so he surrenders. God's like that sheriff. You can walk away, but let me tell you something, you can't get away. He is a God of pursuit. Now, here's what God wants when we feel Him pursuing us, He wants us to turn around and repent. God wants us to say, listen, I've made a mistake. I'm sorry. I rebelled against you. Father, will you forgive me? But you know what? So oftentimes, that's not the way it works out. Especially in the case of Gomer because as, as we continue to read, she keeps walking. She keeps running from God, which again, remember this is a double drama. This is also making reference to the children of Israel. You know, God would, would pursue them. He would send His prophets to warn them, but they just kept going further and further away from God, indulging in all kinds of sinful acts, including idolatry. But let me ask you a question this morning. When God pursues us and we don't turn, what does God do? Does He give up eventually and just say, oh, boys will be boys and girls will be girls? No. As we dive into this story, we, we learn some things about God. First of all, number one, God barricades us with briars. Look at Hosea chapter 2, and we're going to start reading in verse 6. Notice what it says, "...but I will fence her in with thorn bushes. I will block the road to make her lose her way." I'll never forget when I lived in Robertsdale, there was some woods behind our house. And as a family, usually on family day, we would go out to the woods and, and we would build forts as a family. And our kids, they knew how to get back there and, and they knew how to get back to the house. We went out there a lot. But one of the things we always loved to do is on the way back, we wanted to see who could get out first. And so there was this one occasion where we were coming back from the woods and the kids take off in front of me. Well, I look to the left and I see this opening and I, I'm thinking to myself, man, this looks, this looks easier, this route. And I bet it's a lot quicker. 
And so I'm going to go this way so that when I get out of the woods, I'm going to look at my kids and say, in your face, okay? And for those of you who are visiting, I'm sorry, our, our family's competitive, okay? So anyway, I had this in my mind, and the whole time I'm telling you, I am laughing to myself. This is going to be awesome. I'm going to rub it in their face. But it gets to the point, as I'm winding back in there, that I'm like, man, where in the world am I? You ever been that way spiritually? You ever gotten to a point where you've drifted away from God and you just ask yourself, where in the world am I and how did I get to this point? And that's where Gomer is. And then finally she hits this wall of, of briars, right? And, and that's me. Here I go, man. I'm, where am I? And I keep going. I've got to pursue. I've got to see this thing through. And I come across these thorns. And I'm like, well, I'll just step on them and hold them back. And I'm trying to maneuver and pull myself through. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Briars hurt, okay? And, and I got tore up. It was terrible. It was so bad that I had to turn around, go all the way back to the right path so that I could find my way out. And by the time I got out, my kids are like, where you been? In your face. Right? Sometimes God will put up briars where we begin to feel the scratch of sin where we began to feel the consequences of our actions. And the whole purpose of this is so we will turn back. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to look at verses 5 through 7. I'm not going to put it up on the screen because it's kind of a lengthy reading. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when He rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one He loves, and He chastens everyone He accepts as His Son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as His children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? And if you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. Not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who discipline us, and we respect them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They discipline us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our own good in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. In other words, guys, God loves us so much that He at times will make it tough on us when we walk away from Him. And sometimes that's hard for us to swallow. And we began to question why. Gomer probably began to question why. Watch number 7. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. Notice what God does. When she runs after her lovers, she won't be able to catch up with them. She will search for them, but not find them. Notice, God is making things, making things difficult on her. Now you have to remember at this point, Gomer has had some time melt off the clock in her life. She's not as young as she once was. Not to mention, as we began to read in chapter 1, she's had three children. Okay? And so her body is not as beautiful as it once was as a prostitute. And so guess what? The calls aren't coming in. The men are no longer chasing her. And so now, Gomer's in big trouble. Now, here's a question. Why was Gomer in this state? Why was Gomer where she was? And, and so many times, I, I think we oftentimes, we ask ourselves that qu same question. Like I said, how did I get here? And, and really, I think verse 8 answers that. Look at, look at verse 8 of chapter 2. Notice what God says here. She doesn't realize that it was I who gave her everything she has. The grain, the wine, the olive oil, even the gold and the silver used in worshiping the god Baal were gifts from me. Are you following me? Let me tell you something, folks. We are so 
stinking blessed. I mean, we are just absolutely blessed. God showers His blessings upon us, but so oftentimes what you'll see people do is they will credit everything to something besides God. I'm, I'm where I'm at because of me. I'm where I'm at because of my education. I'm where I'm at because of my athleticism. I have made myself where I am today. And God says, you have forgotten me. In other words, in our pride, so oftentimes we walk away. James says, listen, you need to remember from where every good and perfect gift comes from, and that is God. And it's the same cycle with the children of Israel. Going back to that double drama, things would go so well for them. God would bless them. Even to the point to where they would harvest for so many years and then they could lay off for, for a, a year because they were so blessed by God. But then they would forget. And in their pride, they would walk away. Some people walk away and the briars aren't enough to keep them from turning around. They just bust right through. How many of you have ever seen these uh, underground fences? You know, you put the, the shock collar on the dog, and whenever the dog gets close to this underground line, which keeps the animal in its area, as it gets close to where it's not supposed to be, it receives a shock. Some of you may have that. And most of the time, it will keep an animal exactly where it needs to be in its designated location. But there are some dogs, and you can watch this on YouTube, it's kind of hilarious. There are some dogs that will just, I mean, they will take the pain. They will just grit through the pain, and they will bust through that shock so that they can end up on the other side. There are some people spiritually who will take the pain. And they'll bust through. I mean, God has placed around our life these fences and guidelines and guardrails, and He's given us the Holy Spirit to warn us when we get close to crossing that. John chapter 16, verse 8. But every time we disregard God's warnings, every time we bust through the fence, let me tell you something, we pay the price. You look at those dogs... Most of the time they end up lost. They're scared to death. Some of them get hit by a car or they're picked up by someone other than their, their owner. And, and in a very real way for us, it's the same thing. We pay a high price when we walk away from God. And some of you may be saying, well, let me tell you something. I've, I've bust through the briars. I've, I've jumped the fence and I don't feel anything. In fact, I'm doing pretty good. But I'm here to tell you this morning, just wait. Just wait, because here's what you need to know about sin. Sin will take you a lot further than you want to go. It will keep you a lot longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. And that's not just from what I've seen in the world. That's what I've experienced with my own life. Take a, take a lesson from me. It will cost you to live apart and separate from God. Some don't stop. But you know what? God doesn't stop either. And what we see is God also in this story ruthlessly removing resources. Look at verse 9 now of chapter 2. But now, God says, I will take back the wine and what ripened grain I generously provided each harvest season. I will take away the linen and the wool clothing I gave her to cover her nakedness. Okay, so as she is dealing with the briars, at least Gomer has her essentials provided for, right? I mean, she's, she's being provided for. She's, she's okay at this point. But now, as she busts through the, the briars, God knocks out all her resources. 
He takes away her provisions. Well, you know what? You're not going to have that wool anymore. And you know what? You're not going to have that food anymore. Kind of reminds me of the story of the prodigal son right now in our Sunday morning class. We are going through the parables of Jesus. And in that story, you have the younger son, right, who comes to his father and he says, Dad, he says, I can't wait for you to die. I want my inheritance now. And the father who represents God in the story gives the younger son his inheritance. And he goes out and the Bible says he goes to a foreign country where he, he spends this inheritance on wild living. And then God puts up the briars. A famine strikes the land. He spends all of his inheritance, but does the younger son turn? No, he goes headlong into those briars. He breaks through, and so God starts taking away the resources. It gets to the point where the younger son has nothing, and no one will help him in any way. And so he turns to this pig farmer, which was detestable to the Jews. Pigs, they were unclean animals. That's how bad things had gotten. I mean, he is headlong into this thing and he keeps going, but it, it gets to the point to where he is so hungry. He has nothing to eat. It gets so bad that he begins to desire the slop that he is feeding the pigs. And it was then that the younger, came, the younger son came to his senses and he said, you know what, I'm going home. And that's the whole purpose of, of what God is doing here. You know, so oftentimes He has to remove our resources. He has to let us fall on our, our face so that we will look up and turn back to Him. I'm almost finished. I know of an individual... That's been in my life for several years. And several years ago, he went on a search for freedom. He wanted to be independent. He wanted to do whatever he wanted to do. He didn't want to take, he didn't want to take any advice from anyone. But here's what happens in our search for freedom as we break God's principles and His precepts we end up going from free to becoming slaves. The freedom that we think comes from being free in reality makes us a slave to sin, a slave to our desires. And that's what ended up happening to this individual. And that's what happens to us many times. We're in search of freedom, but we become a slave. A slave to anger, a slave to lust, a slave to greed. But here's the deal. When we live for Jesus, He gives us true freedom. He gives us liberation. Gomer becomes a slave. As you continue to read, the resources are gone. The calls are no longer coming in. And things get so bad that she has to sell herself into slavery. And you won't see this in the text, but as you research history during that day and time, a slave auction worked something like this. They would take you and they would strip you of your clothing and you would have to stand there in front of all these people so that they could see your strengths and so they could see your, your weaknesses. And so you can imagine how humiliating that would be. And some of you are probably thinking, well, you know, God put up the hedge and, and, and God took away the resources. Now He's really going to let her have it, but that's not the case. What we see now in chapter 3 is God ambushes her with His amazing, irrational grace. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. This is pretty amazing. Then the Lord said to me, talking to Hosea, go and get your wife again. Bring her back to you and love her even though she loves adultery. Can you imagine? I mean, just put yourself in the place of Hosea. Don't you imagine in his mind, he's thinking, God, are you kidding me? 
This woman has cheated on me, and you want me to go back and not only take her back, but you expect me to love her? And God says, yes. He says, for the Lord still loves Israel. And instead of Israel there, put your name. For the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned other gods, offering them choice gifts. So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and about five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Okay, so just try and picture this in your mind, if, if you will. The auctioneer says, what is my bid for this woman, Gomer? And bids start going around. I'll give you five. I'll give you ten. I'll give you twelve. And then there's a hand that comes out in the back and he says, I'll give you fifteen pieces of silver. And on top of that, I'll give you five bushels of barley. And on top of that, I will give you a measure of wine. And, and you can just hear people gasping, she's not worth that. Are you kidding me? And finally, the auctioneer, making sure that he doesn't change his mind, going once, going twice, sold to the man back there. Come on up, brother. And now, Gomer's thinking to herself, oh no, I'm a piece of property. I could be killed. I could be raped. I could be tortured. But out of the back of the crowd walks up Hosea. And he takes some cover, or maybe a robe, and he covers her nakedness. And he walks her back home, and he continues to love her. What do you think is going through the mind of Gomer? Don't you think in her mind she's thinking about the irrational, unconditional love, the grace and the mercy of God Almighty? Let me tell you something. Every one of us here can relate to Gomer in that all of us have things bidding for us. We were slaves to sin. And there's all these voices bidding for us, but from the back comes a nail-scarred hand. I'll give you my life. I'll give you my blood. And the auctioneer says, Soul. And Jesus walks forward. And through His blood, we are clothed in His righteousness. And He clothes us with forgiveness. But the question this morning that I want to leave you with, have you responded to His love? Don't let Satan deceive you into thinking, you know what, I can never come back. Don't let him deceive you into thinking, you know what, I, I could never have a relationship with God after all the terrible things that I've done. I've had people say, Slate, you just don't know. And you're right, I don't know your life, but what I do know is our God. And through the power of His blood, He can forgive you of anything and everything that you have ever done. And this morning, it may be that you need to put on Christ in baptism. Having all your sins comple completely washed away, Acts chapter 2, verse 16, through the blood of Jesus. Or it may be that there are some of you here this morning as a Christian, you know what? God's been pursuing you and you've just been taking out briars and He's even chopped out some of your resources. And the question is, what's it going to take for you to turn back to where the blessings are really found? You go back to the, to the prodigal son. Do you realize the younger son left the blessings? The blessings of being with a wonderful father. The blessings of having a father who took care of him and providing for him. And he gave up all that for a period of time. And I'm here to tell you that you have a father who is waiting on you. You can return back to the blessings of having an awesome God in your life. And so if you need to respond for any reason... 
Um, we want to encourage you to do that. If, if you know, it makes you uncomfortable to come forward and, and confess something in your life, or you want to talk to someone, myself, or one of our elders more about Jesus and, and baptism, um, we have a room in the back to our right. One of our elders will be back there to pray with you and to minister with you. One of our elders will come forward this morning and take your, take your confession if there's something that you need prayers for. Whatever the case may be, if you need to respond, won't you come? Together we stand and sing.